Innovation is, in fact, a process of continuous and increased complexity. It goes from left to right. And at the same time, innovation becomes a commodity and over time past a part, of the present, part of the past. Or nostalgia. It's a continuous process of transformation. Now, you'll see that every, time, every uh, complexity, every innovation has its own time span. In 1876, somebody sold his horse and put an engine on his wagon. It took him probably five years before knowing that he would be successful. And in the meanwhile, other innovations were added, which all have their own time span. But we didn't build a sustainable means of transport. And why did we not do that in the first place? Were there, was it too complex? Or were there constraints? And will it ever lead us to sustainable mobility? Or do we need other material to, to get at that level? The first constraint is the state of the environment from a political, economical, social, religious, technological perspective. And the second uh, constraint is the paradox of strategy. Are we willing to invest in something that's sustainable, of which we will only see the results within 20 years, and wait for a return on investment so long, are we willing to deal with that complexity? But if you remove those constraints, how come that some people create innovations with a very short time, time span and others create innovations that can change society? Now, if, you dis if this is your problem and you have to find an innovative solution, the question is, what is the problem that you see? Do you see a security issue? It's quite easy to solve. Everybody who is not in the train gets off the train. Do you see a comfort problem? Do you see a capacity problem? But do you also see the transport problem? Because in that country you have a demographic incremental increase which will not help you if if you only want to increase the capacity of this train. By the moment that you have added one or two wagons, the problem re-arises. And as a famous Pullman said, when all think alike, then no one is thinking. Additionally, Einstein said that you cannot solve problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. This is a problem, typical problem, where you can't solve the security issue if you do not solve the transport or mobility issue. So it's way beyond the simple problem of complexity. So there are quite different levels of complexity, as you can see. And some of us are able to solve those very tangible problems and create very tangible innovations. And only few are able, as this man, to solve very sustainable, long-term um, innovations. Um, there are two persons. Elio Jack uh, started his research in 1950 around complexity and the interaction with mental processing capability, working on organizational developments in uh, some, co uh, some uh, companies. Together with Gillian Stamp, discovered that there is a correlation between, on the left side, the level of complexity and the level of work, and on the right side, the level of mental processing capability of an individual. And it's based on those theories that all companies are built. You can distinguish seven different levels of complexity. The first level is your quality level. It's the level of the operator who uses his touch and feel to resolve simple products, sim simple problems, and work at very tangible things within well-defined prescriptions. It's my gardener. Very high level of quality, but often bad service, always too late. At the service level, people accumulate data. They work within a frame, look for the options within the data that is present, and try to find a solution within that existing data. And they use it to serve customers or to, to serve uh, colleagues internally or externally. 
And at the highest level within the first circle, you have practice. Practice means going for good and best practice. We combine the power of means and people to make the best of it. We look at the series of activities. Don't look at the data as such, but look, we look how data is structured and try to find innovation by looking at the efficiency of the, of the structure of the data. They go for best practice, and best practice is applied innovation because we apply innovations that has been invented by others. And what we finally add in that first circle is we add value for the present. We try to manage what is already there and make the best of it. Go for a professional organization with good quality level, a good service level, and in a very efficient way. Now, at the fourth level, teams become quite different. We start looking at the interaction between the present and the future and try to model that future. We look at scenarios, how we can bring the past, the present and the future together. So we model. It's there where we go for product development, market development or new practices. We develop new concepts, while at level three, we try to make the best of what there is. And often this is due to a strategic intent that has been identified. Strategic intent is all about who do we want to be and for who. For the people we employ, the customers we serve, the investors who invested in our company. Who do we want to be? The question, if you look at the railway company, you can ask a question, who are they really want to be? What are they doing? How come that their um, use of their railway has brought them to this kind of situations? Was their purpose clear? So strategic intent. People at strategic intent, they make everything abstract and interact everything with everything. They start to weave. And at corporate citizenship, what they do is they finally add an additional role. They don't look only at their customers to serve and at their people to serve. They try to serve society and integrate a societal part within their strategic role. The companies like Danone, they don't sell food, they, don't sell, they only sell healthy food. And it's quite different than saying that you're a producer of uh, yogurt and they live their uh, strategic intent also. Corporate pre-science are institutes like the uh, President of the United States, the Europe, European Committee, which strategic role is to build value for future generations. And they're struggling. They're struggling very hard because they have a difficulty to integrate all different components. Now, the result is, is when you look at people and you look at their mental processing capability, you get quite some differences. At level one, you have the executor. He, ex he executes what is prescribed. At level two, you have your problem solvers. They serve customers by solving individual problems. And at level three, we call them the process innovators. Optimizing the process efficiency is their middle name. Level four people, product market practice innovators, service innovators, people who, who want to build, connecting the present with the future. And at level five, the transformers, rethinking your business model and trying to build a center of excellence, a source of innovation for the future. While at level four, they anticipate trends. At level five, they are trendsetters. And at level six, they only set trends that have impact on future generations. This is an anal analysis we did on the trends top 120,000 of the number of companies you have at each, at each level because there is a certain correlation between um, sales, complexity. So in white you find at level two 110,000 companies and at level six 10 corporates. If you would go on their website, you will see that their strategic intent is completely different. Here you will read things about serving customers and, and offering a good quality. Here you will find information on who they want to be. And here you will find information how they will add value to society. You have the very small companies with an average employment of five people. 
going to 35 to 104, 665, 4,000. And a gross operating income per full-time equivalent from 69,000 to 168,000. Now, the, these are averages from uh, production, service, and retail companies. So don't look at the uh, figures as such, but look at the differences. What we see is that those number of companies get reduced. They are taking over and the complexity is reduced. They are integrated as a business unit within a global international structure. Which means that you get an overcapacity of people with this capability level. Who often have to go abroad to find another opportunity. And another thing that you see here, that you probably have here companies with the capability which is far beyond their current level. But with, uh, if you look at the, uh, when I'm talking about constraints, environmental, economic constraints, gross operating margin per full-time equivalent is about 69,000 euros. So you have to deduct your cost of your personnel, your amortization of your investments, your interest rates, and your taxes. So the net income that you can reinvest in your company is quite low. So you have to be, from a personality point of view, quite an entrepreneur to take the risk and do the next step. Quite interesting. Some companies get stuck here, some get stuck here. Uh, is, it, is that a problem? No, they feel, they feel very comfortable they're at their level of work. Is it a problem? Can be as long as your competitors allow you to stay there. Because this is globalization. This is how companies evolve. And in the mature sectors, all already all at this level. And you see integration, this disintegration. What you have seen in the financial sector, they have to disintegrate because it was becoming too complex and not managed in a sufficient way. What you have seen in China, that the last 50 years, they have built this capacity. We've learned them how to manage what we already knew. We transformed and give them our experience. But they have also people at this level. And they're quite faster. And as the previous speaker said, the numbers are increasing because population are increasing. So the number of people who are, because this is really where you get the real innovation. The number of people who are really acting on strategic development, strategic intent, and looking for long-term innovation, modeling the future, adding components together who have nothing to do with each other, they are here. And those numbers are continuously increasing, which makes the, the um, process of innovation going faster and faster and faster. And as he said, these people who are very good in making applications are putting additional, additional, and additional applications on your iPad. And within a few months, somebody will be reflect how to get all that far more efficient. Because they go for options. They go for efficiency. And when at the end, even with efficiency, you can't solve the problem anymore, you will go probably for new technology to be able to capture that complexity again. Now, my experience with with how we are learned to look at people is that we have the intention especially to look at personality and expertise. Which means that if those were people, you would probably only hire them if you are going to make a new Star Wars movie. Because we don't look at their mental processing capability. And the reason why is when you're in an interview with a candidate, it's very hard to see the different between is he telling us something of his experience or is he telling us something that he sees. These are two main different things. So it's capability that drives complexity. And it's complexity that drives growth and innovation. So my question to you all is, who makes what decision at all that level of complexity within your organization? Thank you. <laughs>